All right, welcome and thank you for letting me join you all today to talk about canning. So what we're gonna do today is I am going to open up with a PowerPoint slide and then after that, we'll go take a short break and then we'll transition to the hands-on portion so you can actually see what I'm doing. And it will hopefully be a good opportunity for folks to kind of piece what you heard about in this presentation to the actual activity. And then, you know, if the volume's not good, just type in chat to let John know and he'll relay that to me. So I'm the Family and Consumer Sciences agent in the greater Baltimore area. And just to let folks know, there are other Family and Consumer Sciences agents either in your county or in your cluster as we still go about. So right now, tomorrow, we're going to be training some other FCS agents. So Joy in Frederick County, Cheryl in Queen Anne's County, Crystal in the Lower Shore, and Troy over on the Calvert Southern Cluster. And they're all going to be trained as of tomorrow to help answer any sort of canning needs you might have, as well as being able to test your pressure canner dial if you have a canner with that and those needs. So we'll begin. Another thing too to note is that we'll visit a couple of websites either after the presentation or after we finish the hands-on portion that are going to be some really helpful resources for you all when you're canning some of your garden's harvest. We do wanna emphasize acknowledgements, especially for the National Center for Home Food Preservation which is sponsored by Georgia's or University of Georgia's Cooperative Extension. They are the gurus to anything preserved, whether it's canning, freezing, or drying for your needs. And we'll visit their website, as well as the USDA's Complete Guide to Home Canning, and a few other shout outs to some resources from other extensions that we use for this material. So when we think about canning, we know that the name of the game for a shelf stable, so it doesn't need to be refrigerated, is that you're really going for that vacuum seal. So we know that when you're thinking about a canned product, maybe it's canned green beans or a canned piece of fruit that you enjoy, that when you're thinking about that jar of canned food, that jar has gone through some sort of heating process, right? And so for us, our heating process is going to be using a boiling water bath canner. And when we're putting our jars through a boiling water bath canner or a pressure canner, we know that it's helping to remove oxygen from the jar. We know that the heat is going to help kill any enzymes that would naturally spoil your canned product. And that vacuum seal is a great indicator. So one of the things to keep in mind too, a great vacuum seal is going to help make sure none of your jar's contents of food comes out and nothing that you don't want goes into that jar of food, which could spoil it or lead to foodborne illness concerns. And here we have a screenshot from a YouTube video from Ball Company, and they're really just talking about the thermal processing temperature. And you see a graph and you still get some carryover kill, but you'll actually get more death from microorganisms, whether they're yeast, molds, and bacteria during the cool down phase and not so much the heating process, which I thought was interesting. So when you're thinking about canning, really the stove top methods are the best. You're either using a pressure canner or a boiling water bath canner. So if we're looking at the two canners, we have a dial gauge pressure canner on your upper left-hand side and on the bottom right, you have a weighted gauge pressure canner. They both do the same thing, but with a dial gauge, you need to have the dial checked every year by an extension service, just to make sure that the pressure is reading true. Dial might be something you want to invest in if you're someone that looks, likes to look for a number, whereas a weighted gauge pressure canner, you're listening for a jiggling or rocking as the manufacturer recommends for that type of weighted gauge pressure canner. And for pressure canning, you're going to use low acid 
with a high pH number. So it could be your vegetables and water, it could be chicken, seafood, beef, things of that nature. The other side on the right-hand column, you have your boiling water bath canner at the top, and at the bottom you have your atmospheric steam canner. Both have been proven to work well for anything like jams and jellies, pickled products, fruit and water, and even tomatoes. But the recommendation for atmospheric steam canners is that you wouldn't want to put a jar of food that's going to need 40 minutes or longer to process, just because you're using less water. And the concern would be if you're processing tomatoes in a quart sized jar, you might evaporate all your liquid source. And that wouldn't be good for safety and quality reasons. So if you're doing a boiling water bath canner that requires 40 minutes to 45 minutes or higher, go with a boiling water bath canner. And that's what we're using today. Some of the things that we don't recommend for canning is open kettle canning. So that would be putting in your pot of strawberries, sugar, commercial lemon juice, commercial pectin, letting it boil and put that hot mixture into your jar and calling it a day. That means that that jar of strawberry jam never goes through a final process in your boiling water bath canner. And we don't recommend that. Other things you might see on the internet or heard through friends is microwave canning, dishwasher canning, all these other methods we don't recommend because you're still gonna have cold spots that don't efficiently get heat penetrated through. And if there's cold spots, that means that your jar content has been under processed and you might have some food safety as well as quality concerns for that shelf stable food item. And electric pressure cookers. So now you're seeing a lot about electric pressure cookers, electric pressure canners. There still needs to be a lot more research that needs to be done on this topic but the recommendation is not to use electric pressure cookers or canners for home canning. You still want to use the stovetop version for your pressure canners and uh, to some extent your water bath canners. And we can talk more. We actually uh, worked together with the University of Georgia's Cooperative Extension to test some different electric pressure canners. So there's a lot of different things out on the market. Um, one of the canners that does seem to be great is going to be the ball electric water bath or multi-cooker as an electric boiling water bath canning appliance. And the reason for that is that we know it gets hot enough, the temperature is where it needs to. And for someone that might have a bad back and can't lift a boiling water bath canner with the weight of the water and everything else, or maybe your stovetop doesn't support canning, it's a good option. So I alluded to electric pressure cookers and canners. Utah State's extension did a study on this. And then we looked at the same concept at an elevation of zero feet, so sea level to a thousand feet. So stove range. That's another key thing that you really want to check on. I love gas personally because you can see the flame, you're able to control it a little bit better. And then electric. So if you're someone that has an electric smooth top, you definitely want to make sure that the manufacturers allow you to actually can on that smooth top electric range. Some of the concerns about electric smooth top ranges is that they may have a safety feature that once you hit a certain temperature on that range, it turns off. And that's not good because when you're canning, you want constant heat. You don't want heat to stop during your processing time. Another thing too that you want to look for in terms of your smooth top electric range is whether or not there's a weight limit for canning. Sometimes you might see that they can support 50 pounds of weight on the surface and that's it. Other companies may say, don't use your smooth top for canning activities at all. So these are some good things to know in advance. 
Another thing too, if you have a smooth top or coils, read the manufacturer's instructions because they may tell you that for the base of the canner, it needs to be flat and not rigid. So these are some key things that you'll want to check out before you start canning. We're also seeing new stove ranges. Well, not so new, but induction ranges becoming more popular. So again, just make sure you read the manufacturer's directions for your induction range. So you're buying the appropriate canner that is actually going to conduct the heat that you need. Another important thing with canning is knowing the pH of your produce or whatever your food item is. So here we see a table where we have the pH range going from 1.0 to 14.0. And when you talk about canning, whether it's home canning or commercial canning for what you might buy at the grocery store, the pH of 4.6 is the magic number. Anything as you see here between a pH of 1.0 and 4.6 is going to be safe for water bath canning. And we see that they're low pH, high acid food items like strawberries, peaches, lemons. Then if you have, let's say a theoretical pH of 4.7 to 14.0, you would want to pressure can these items. So these items are gonna have that high pH number and low acidity. So those are your vegetables, your dairy, your mixed dishes. And so when we think about the pH of 4.6, you see tomatoes that are hovering that line. So a good tested recipe is going to have you acidify each jar. So basically what they're asking you is to add acid. You're either adding white vinegar or cider vinegar at 5% acidity. You might be adding a commercial lemon juice or you might be adding citric acid. And what they're doing there is just ensuring that regardless of the tomato variety, the pH is going to be acidic enough that it's safe for boiling water bath canning. And we'll come back to the importance of knowing your pH of your produce and food items and how it relates to botulism. But again, tomatoes, Asian pears are typically going to be some of those produce that are dancing on that 4.6 pH. And you'll often see that a tested recipe is asking you to acidify each jar to ensure safety and quality of your food item. So again, anything that's going to have a pH of 4.6 or higher is going to be pressure canned. So again, you're seeing pumpkins, you're seeing peas, you're seeing okra. So again, if you're canning okra in water, it's getting pressure canned. If you're pickling your okra, pickling your peas, you're adding acid, and that's gonna be safe enough to water bath can. Any questions on this particular area, John, or are we, we good? We have one. Okay. Can I safely use my portable propane burner for my pressure canner outdoors? So the things with the propane canners, um, we know that for the best canning and safety, even for your equipment, you don't want to exceed a BTU of 12,000. So some of the concerns with an outdoor propane tank would be that the butane level would be so, so high that it could actually warp, warp the, the base of your canner. So we know that some of the commercial kitchens, right, some of the gas stoves might have BTUs of 33,000. So those wouldn't be appropriate either if you had like a commercial stove in your home. Yeah, um, are all store bought lemon juices safe for canning or like vinegar? Do they come in different acid strengths? That, so that's a good question. So one of the things, and we can kind of tease, is that if you're buying cider vinegar, you should see up front, of course, it's going to be in teeny tiny letters or print, but it's going to say 5% acidity, and that's what you're looking for. So the manufacturer is adjusting the pH as needed for your vinegars. In terms of the lemon juice, I'm assuming they're doing a similar process. We just don't want you to buy fresh lemons and squeeze them because there's going to be too much variability with the pH potentially. So commercial grade lemon juice is definitely what you want. 
commercial grade at 5% acidity, white distilled vinegar or apple cider, cider vinegar is what you want to ensure quality and safety. Sure, so any stovetop, especially when we're talking gas, you don't want a BTU of 12,000 or higher. Anything that's 12,000 and higher runs the risk of warping the base of your canner. Other things too about outdoor canning, we would be concerned about winds not having um, a, a nice contact of flame to the base of the canner. So winds could probably play a little bit with some safety and quality concerns. So when we talk about a tested recipe, we're not talking about having you ask some friends, hey, did you like the cucumber pickles I made? What was your favorite flavor? When we're talking about tested recipes, we're talking about food scientists that have their white coats and testing for pH, time and temperature. So you know you're going to get a consistent and safe product. So some of the recommendations for finding a tested recipe is going to be so easy to preserve, the sixth edition that we have here. Another one is the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, and we'll visit those resources. And then any extension website should be a good reference as well. And the good thing is all the recipes from the National Center for Home Food Preservation as well as USDA are free and open to the public. We highly recommend avoiding outdated cookbooks, internet blogs, um, YouTube people you might follow, just because the University of Maine's extension did do a small study just looking at salsa recipes from Facebook people and saw that there were many steps that were cut that would increase food safety risks. So again, using tested recipes from the National Center for Home Food Preservation and USDA are really highly emphasized by us. Again, you wanna follow the recipe because the shape, the ingredients are there for a reason. Now, family recipes, right? People have family recipes. They have recipes that they wanna create and make on their own. So if you're someone that wants to validate to make sure that family recipe is safe or that new salsa recipe you just created is safe, we highly recommend that you work with a process authority. They're going to be the food scientists and the lab coats that are going to be able to test for the pH as well as the processing time and temps for your product and your jar size. And they can also give you further guidance about what to do or not to do with that recipe. So for example, if I'm here in the Baltimore City Extension office and we created our own salsa recipe, sent it out to a process authority to get the food science specs on it, that recipe would be appropriate for this extension office. I can't bring it up to Baltimore County. I can't bring it home. So there's some parameters with that, but at least from a health and safety point of view, you know where that food product is. Um, I would recommend sticking with some of the land grant universities for your process authority, just because they're more economical than maybe a private lab. Another important thing is knowing your elevation. So we know that water boils at a lower temperature at higher elevations. So essentially wherever you are in Maryland, you're never going to need to make adjustments unless you start creeping into Western Maryland. So where we are now in Baltimore City, we're essentially at sea level. We're well under a thousand feet of elevation. So we know based on where we are, water boiling is going to be 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But if we start creeping up into Western Maryland, let's say we'll round out at 4,000 feet, the boiling point of water is 204 degrees Fahrenheit. So what does that mean when I'm canning? Well, if you look at the table one below for peaches, it shows you that as your elevation increases beyond 1,000 feet, you're going to have a longer processing time. So if we were canning pints of 
peaches through the hot pack method, our peaches would process for 20 minutes. But if we start creeping into Western Maryland, our processing time might be 10 minutes longer. So 30 minutes between that 3,001 to 6,000 feet of elevation. And your tested recipes are often going to give you those tables for adjustments. So looking at temperatures, let's hone in on 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So we know at sea level, this is the boiling point of water. And at this temperature, we're really going to kill a lot of the yeast, mold, and bacteria of public health concern. Now, botulism is the one that everyone talks about, right? And so for botulism concerns, you really need a temperature of 240 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit to injure the botulism spore so it can't produce the toxin. And to do that, to get to that temperature of 240 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, you really do need a pressure canner because there's no other way to achieve that temperature at sea level other than using a pressure canner. So when we're talking about botulism, it's a bacteria naturally found in nature. As a bacteria, we know it creates a spore and kind of like seeds, right? Let's take a green bean, for example, a green bean seed. Um, we know that the green bean seed is going to sprout when the temperature, the food, the moisture level is just right and grow or germinate. Botulism is kind of the same way. They have a spore that's very hardy. It can withstand very harsh conditions, and it's just waiting for the right environment to create it's toxin. So botulism as a bacteria does not like to live and grow in, a, in an acidic environment. So if we're thinking about those jams and jellies, pickle foods, fruits, that's not a happy place for botulism to grow. So if you're someone making jams and jellies, pickle products, or fruits, and even tomatoes, you're rarely going to see botulism cases related to home canning with those products. What you're typically going to see is botulism cases related to those high pH food items. So chicken, um, beef, seafood, vegetables and water and mixed dishes. Because those food items, botulism likes a higher pH range also with canning, we create an environment with very little oxygen, which is another thing the spore wants to survive. So you can see from the graph that we have two temperatures. On the X axis, we have time, and on the Y, we have temperature. And so a lot of times I might get phone calls of people saying, hey, I'm going to water bath can my green beans in water. And I'll say, you really want to use a pressure canner for that kind of food item. And they'll say, oh, well, instead of processing my green beans and water for 30 minutes, I'm going to process them for an hour. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how long you boil your green beans in water and a water bath canner because the highest temperature you'll ever achieve is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's never going to be enough to injure or kill botulism spores. You need that pressure canner that's gonna let you kick up to that 240 to 250 degree temperature range in addition to the pressure to injure and possibly kill botulism. If you think you have botulism, the symptoms come on pretty quickly, dry mouth, uh, blurred vision, slurred speech. And you, know, you obviously wanna seek medical treatment immediately but the good thing with botulism, I like to say for folks in Maryland, based on our location, I feel that it would be easier and faster to get an antitoxin. So if you did have symptoms and you actually did have botulism, I think the hospitals based on where we are nationally would probably be able to get an antitoxin to you pretty quickly. There have been some outbreaks related to home canning, just out of the good nature of people's hearts, Maybe they weren't up to date on more current canning practices and things happened. 
but you're here today to learn about some good tips and tricks for a safe home food preservation. There's some other resources around if you're curious about botulism. You can actually see some of the spores where it looks like little air vacuoles. And, um, you know, Botox. We've all heard of Botox. That's a very pure form of botulinum A. So not only can it be a toxin that's bad for health, but people might use it for therapeutic and other kinds of purposes. So if your garden isn't plentiful at home, I would definitely recommend visiting Maryland's Best. Um, you can find CSAs, pick your own, farmer's markets, all sorts of produce beyond your town, your city, your county limits. So if you're vacationing in a different part of the state, use the website to find some fresh produce as well as other great Maryland agricultural products. For your own home garden, we would recommend that you only harvest a batch worth. So then you're not fighting your fridge for storage space. We also recommend that you would want to wash or rinse your produce right before you cook it or eat it raw. In terms of your canner, you wanna use a Mason style canner. We recommend using the styles that you see here. I know that there's a lot more different sizes and shapes of Mason jars in recent years, but using these standard either as regular mouths that have the shoulder or a wide mouth where you don't have a shoulder are still the best options for canning purposes. Jars that we don't recommend are the commercial jars because they were engineered for a completely different purpose than what you're doing at home. The old style jars, like the one you see in the middle, it has a one piece zinc lid and those aren't recommended now because the two piece metal lid has a very good vacuum seal. The old style WEC jars that you see on the left, there just hasn't been any research about how effective they are for home canning. We also know that they have a lot of pieces to them that are easy to lose, as well as the price. They're pretty expensive as a jar alone. So it might not be an economical choice in that standpoint. So one of the things that we did for you today is that we, cleaned the jars, the glass jars, we looked for cracks, we looked for nicks, and right now we have them pre-sterilizing, kind of like you see in the picture in the background. We filled our canner up, we put the rack in, we put the jars on top, and we added enough water to cover the top of the jars, and we brought the whole canner up to a boil. You want your jars to boil based on our elevation for 10 minutes or longer to be pre-sterilized. So there's three ways that you could sterilize your jars. And we know sterilization is important to prevent microorganisms from spoiling or causing foodborne illness. So the first way is doing what we did with the jars pre-sterilizing in the boiling water bath canner. A second way to sterilize your jars is if you have a dishwasher with a sterilization setting. So from then, it's just a timing piece because you want to keep those jars that are in your dishwasher warm and time it just right so you can pack your food product into that warm jar before going into a water bath canner or a pressure canner. The other thing that you can do is consider your processing time as both the processing time and sterilization time. So for our recipe today, we're processing our cucumbers for 10 minutes. So technically I could consider that the processing time and sterilization time. But I, I like to do a pre-sterilization because it does allow me to catch any glasses that might have a nick or crack that I missed because that jar would be broken before any food got into it. So nothing wasted from a food perspective. So again, the three ways to sterilize your jars is pre-sterilizing them in the water bath canner, two, your dishwasher if you have that setting, three through the processing time of your food items. So 10 minutes or longer based on our current elevation. If you're pressure canning, the temperature and time that you're using is going to sterilize your jars as well as process them. A key thing to note is that you want to avoid temperature fluctuations, right? 
So we want to either keep our jars warm or if we're taking our jars to cool, we want to enjoy, avoid temperature fluctuations. So we want warm jar to have warm food put in. And if we had an ice cold jar and we put food in it and then put it in a canner, it most likely would crack the glass. Similarly, if we're letting the jars cool, hot jar on cold countertop could also crack the glass. So you wanna mediate those two spots. For our canning lids, again, the two-piece metal lid is gonna be the best thing. You can use your jar and your metal screw band as many times as you want. Typically, we'll say that the metal screw band should be discarded once it gets heavily rusted or dented. And then the key thing is, is that that flat metal lid should only be used once for processing. So we'll use new lids today. And after we crack open those cucumber pickles later on, we'll eventually throw that lid out. We won't use it again for another processing venture. Another thing too, there's a lot of different lids coming out. You might've seen plastic lids. University of Georgia did a study a few years ago and saw that the plastic lids just didn't hold a strong vacuum seal for three months onward. So if you're someone that's canning to save and eat your food products four or eight months after you've canned them, the plastic lids may not be a great option. Plus, we still don't have good science to show that the plastic lids can be reused for more than one processing event. So flat metal lid is still what we recommend. Some folks might remember that they needed to keep their metal screw bands and their flat metal lids warm prior to canning. But we actually say read the manufacturer's directions because I know at least for ball, you just need to wash them. You don't need to keep them warm because the concept was that the sealing compound, that ring around the flat metal lid would need to stay warm for some time. So just like the picture, you see that full ring of sealing compound that's going to make its vacuum seal with the top of the glass metal or the top of the glass jar. We'll be using these equipment and I'll talk about them more when they're being used, but you can imagine the funnels making sure everything gets into the jar and not on your counter. The bubble wand is a fabulous tool to get extra air bubbles out. So maybe you can get some more food into your jar. And then the ones that we'll use have that little stair step feature where each little stair step is a quarter inch. And that's a great tool if you're slicing cucumbers to be a quarter inch or other food products that might need to be a half an inch. And then it'll also be used to help us measure headspace. And we'll get to that. Once your jars have been appropriately filled, you'll want to take a damp paper towel or cloth to wipe the rim of the top of the glass jar, just so you get a strong vacuum seal. You don't want seeds or anything else to kind of get in the way between the glass and the sealing compounds. After that, you'll use possibly the, the lid magnet to put that on top of your jar. And then with the screw bands, you're just screwing it until it's fingertip tight. So first resistance. You don't want to hunker the lid on to show how strong you are because there's two problems. One, you might actually cut through the sealing compound so you don't get a vacuum seal. Or two, you might not allow for whatever air is in your jar to come out. So that could cause some breakage issues. So I mentioned headspace. So headspace is just the amount of space between the top of your product and the bottom of your flat metal lid. And it's really just anticipating how much your food product is going to expand during the processing time. So you can see that there's a different amount of headspace for most products, jams and jellies, quarter inch, where something in a pressure canner is going to have an inch or more of headspace. So with jams and jellies, you're cooking everything before you put it into the jar. So a lot of the natural air that's in the cell walls of produce is already kind of cut and deflated. Whereas depending on how you're packing your food items for a pressure canner, whether it's hot pack, so cooking everything at once before putting it in the jar, or what we're doing today, 
we're using a raw pack. So you're putting raw produce and adding a hot liquid to it. There's still a lot of air in that fresh produce. So they're going to expand more during that processing time. But again, that little stair step piece is a great tool because you'll get just the right amount of headspace so your jars appropriately vacuum seal and stays sealed. So once we get our canner loaded, we'll start our timer for the processing time for our recipe of 10 minutes once the canner comes to a rolling boil. You never want to under process your jar based on time because that could lead to safety and quality issues. If you had a power outage or you had to stop the canner at any point of time, you would want to start everything up back at the full amount of processing time that the recipe started because again, the concern would be under processing. Then just to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing for cooling the jars, you'll want to remove the jars. And again, to avoid temperature fluctuations, you're going to put them on a towel or use a cookie rack. And you can see that you're going to space your jars out so they have about an inch or more in between each other. And this is for good air circulation. You really want to make sure that you have a place in your kitchen where your jars can sit undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. So patience comes in. There's no need to force cool your jars, let nature do its thing. And after 12 to 24 hours, you can see if the vacuum seal held. So the photo below actually shows the three ways you can make sure your jars appropriately vacuum sealed. So one is looking for the concaveness. I like that one. The other one is pressing at the top of the flat metal lid. You never want to hear, that's bad. And then the third one is removing the metal screw band and taking a spoon and hitting it and listening for a high pitched noise. I don't like that method because everyone's hearing is different and our own hearing is going to change over time. I much prefer the visual and the tactile method. If your jars didn't vacuum seal, then you have a clock of 24 hours to reprocess your jars. You would need to have a new lid, you would need to re-sterilize your jars, you would need to heat the food items up again. So there's some intricacies that, you know, if they don't vacuum seal, personally, I would either put them in my fridge, my freezer, give them to a neighbor and say, hey, these didn't vacuum seal, so put it in your fridge and eat them within a reasonable amount of time because it just sounds more deflating of your self-esteem to have to reprocess. For storing jars, you can actually remove the metal screw band because again, this thing is only keeping the flat metal lid in place during the processing. And again, it's the flat metal lid in the glass that has the vacuum seal not this. So like you see in the storage pictures, you can clean off the glass threads because there is some goop that spills out and you don't want mold or anything else growing over time. Obviously you wanna label and date your jar of what the food item is. For dating, it's up to you. Date it for when you canned it or date it for when it needs to be eaten. So in, if we were doing cucumber pickles today, we could date it 8-30-2022, or maybe we date it 8-30-2023, depending on what works best for you. We recommend storing your jars in a cool, dry place because sunlight will fade the color of things like your fruit over time. And then just avoid temperature extremes. And we highly recommend eating whatever you can within the year because we're hoping obviously with this group that you're gonna have your gardens for the next year. So let's say you had a jar in storage for a week, a month, close to a year. If you saw any of these signs, throw your jar out like a small biohazard. Do not open it because botulism toxin is odorless. So just inhaling it could start a bad cascade of health events. So again, um, if you saw these signs, 
with a jar that was in your cabinet a week, a month, close to a year out. Don't open it, don't taste test it, please. And then again, we'll highly recommend that you get interested in drying or possibly freezing. Um, we also have the Maryland Food Ventures course, which was the former food for profit. And of course, with the state fair, there's that adult entry. So if you're thinking of canning for next year, think about also entering something that you created into the state fair as well. So we'll pause there and I can answer a few more questions before we transition into the hands-on portion. All right, great. We've got quite a few. Um, the first one is, is it okay to clean the mason jars in a dishwasher? Yeah, so I would definitely recommend if you want to cleaning your mason jars in a dishwasher. Obviously, uh, it will depend on how dirty that mason jar is, right? Something like salt is probably going to not need much of a rinse or a scrub prior to, but if you had some food particles or dirt or bugs, because we don't know how jars are stored, you might want to give it a good scrub to loosen everything else before running them through a dishwasher. Also related to washing, we got a question about how you should wash veggies and should you use warm water or vinegar or what do you recommend? All right, so that's a really good question for vegetable washing. Right now, the best recommendation for washing produce is under potable water. Um, some people have told me that they like to use vinegar, baking soda and acid like apple cider vinegar or lime juice or lemon juice. If you like to do it that way, that's fine. At least it's food safe and meant to be ingested. Uh, if your concern is more bacterial, you're probably not gonna get as much removed or killed as you think with uh, those items. Similarly, uh, people will sometimes say that they'll use a bleach Clorox or soap, and we don't recommend using those because it might leave a chemical residue that's not meant to be ingested. Another thing too, if you are rinsing or washing produce, if you have carrots or cantaloupe that has the netting, you may want to have a dedicated produce brush that can help loosen some of the soil that gets stuck in the nooks and crannies of those kind of produce. All right, so we've got a couple of questions on lids here. The first one is my unused new lids get rust spots on them. Are they safe to use? That's a good question. Um, I think it would depend on where the rust spots are, right? If we're trying to be realistic about things. Uh, in general, from a food safety point, rust would be kind of that potential physical hazard. If the rust was on the top of the flat metal lid and not on the inside, I would assume that should be safe because again, it's gonna be the underside of the lid that may come in contact with food, not the outside. Okay, and then our next lid question is where and how do you keep the lids before you put them on the jars? I worry about flipping them seal side down before putting them on the jar. So if you're thinking about your lids and you're thinking about, um, so I bought some reusable ones because I had some extra glass jars. But for me, if I was, and you'll see with my setup, as I get ready to can, I have a clean paper towel that I have the wash lid sitting on top of. And then it's just really trying to limit how much you're touching the underside of it. Because again, if you were doing something like an apple juice or a jelly, sometimes the processing time is five minutes. So that wouldn't be long enough to say that the lid is possibly sterilized. So um, kind of going back to your question, again, I would just, leave them on a clean surface, face side down to help avoid any um, dust or whatever that might hit the surface when you're canning. If you're thinking about storage long-term, keeping your lids in a dry spot is going to be helpful. And you know, 
you could always call the manufacturer and ask them for their tips for best storing your lids to avoid rust or any other questions you have. All right, so the next two are ones that um, were asked early on and then you did touch a little bit on them. So I don't know if we'll have too much else to say, but the first one is, are there any visual signs or odors that would indicate a canned product is contaminated with botulism? There, so um, bulging could be a good first sign, right? Because we're thinking if botulism is producing a toxin, it's going to be bulging out your jar lid most likely. So that could show gas production or some sort of gas production that we don't know. You wouldn't be able to taste or smell botulism. Again, it's odorless. So if you have any concerns, the, old, the rule of thumb is when in doubt, throw it out. Yes, definitely best to stay safe. The next one is I keep seeing plastic canning jars. Any thoughts? And I know you kind of touched on that a little bit too. Huh, I didn't know there was plastic canning jars. Uh, I would honestly say using a mason jar that is appropriate for hot temperatures, like going through a boiling water bath canner or a pressure canner is going to be best. Not having seen the plastic ones, I don't know if they're um, clear so you can kind of see what's going on inside the jar. You don't know. Um, how the plastic was maybe made or with held, holding certain temperatures. So I would still stick to glass. Okay, the next one, um, perhaps we can find a link and put it in the chat during the break, but do you have a list of processing authorities in Maryland? Yes, I do. So what we'll do is when we take our break and we're setting up for the, the hands-on part, We'll do a quick visit to some of the websites that I highly recommend for produce, for recipes, and also process authorities. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Next question is when canning tomato sauce, do I need to remove the skins or can I blend them in? So I would say the majority of the recipes that I've come across through tested recipes that we like to use are going to require you to remove the skins through blanching. Some of the thought process behind the tomato skins is that they're going to add a bitterness that people aren't going to want. Also, if you're thinking of entering uh, a can of tomato sauce into the state fair, you're also looking at the visual piece. So looking at tomato skins might not be horribly appealing. <laughs> flavor and that alone. Yeah, and actually, you know, talking about skins, um, one of the things people will ask is, can I change out a sweet bell pepper for a hot bell pepper or a hot pepper or vice versa? And I was told by one of the authors of the book and also a former director who's now retired for the National Center that you don't want to switch out bell for hot peppers or vice versa, because the thickness of the skin does play a role in terms of the volume and the safety that they're calculating on the food science end. If you want to add something that's not in a recipe, add it after you crack the jar open. Or if you don't want to make a shelf stable jar, Create what you want, put it in the freezer, create what you want, put it in the refrigerator. Just don't make your own creative recipe as a shelf stable product without having it validated through the proper channels. Yeah, so a couple of follow up questions on that. For the tomato skins, is it unsafe to include them if they don't mind the taste just for a home use? I would say, again, if you're following a tested recipe, there's got to be some level of safety in relation to the skins. I know it's a pain to blanch. You have an extra hot source coming out of your kitchen, the time that it takes to possibly peel the skins, but you're still going to get a better quality and safer products following the blanching steps. And then also related, if you are making a recipe for the state fair or something similar, are people entering tested recipes from a book or recipes that they create and then have independently tested from a processing authority? So that's a, that's a really good question. So 
I get to help judge the 4-H youth events. Um, when I was there last Wednesday judging, I didn't think to go visit the adult category. So if you're going to the state fair, you could probably do a comparison between the adult entries versus the youth. But for the youth entries, we do require that youth put on the tag their process, so boiling water bath canning, the time, 10 minutes, for example, the product, as well as where they got the recipe from. So it could be USDA, the National Center for Home Food Preservation. The adult categories, I don't think they go through that level of detail, but again, we're trying to make sure, at least for the future generations, they know where to get good information and then hopefully continue those good practices as they get older. Got it. Okay. And then the last one for now, what are the pros and cons of canning versus freezing? Yeah. So some of the pros and cons, we would definitely recommend whether you're, you're drying, freezing, or canning, you want to have produce that is at peak flavor and nutritional value. I know a lot of times it's easy to buy seconds at the farmer's market or a roadside stand, but if you're trying to have quality and flavor, then buying produce at its peak is really going to be best. Um, for cucumbers, for example, for what we're doing today, ideally we would want to pick them and process them within 24 hours. Another thing too, when you are considering canning, and I'll talk about freezing, but at least with canning, for example, tomatoes, you can water bath can them or you could pressure can them. Same thing with other fruit. And so some people choose to use a pressure canner because your temperature heats up so much faster in a pressure canner that you're able to retain a little bit more nutritional value than having your tomatoes or fruit being processed in a boiling water bath canner, which does take longer. In terms of freezing, you know that you're still gonna get a little nutritional degradation, whether you're canning or freezing. So, you know, from that nutrition side of things, we're always gonna tell you to eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, but I would say use whatever method is going to be most pragmatic to you. They're both going to contribute to your nutritional value, whether if it's canned, frozen, or fresh or dried. So things to consider, but I would say both are great methods for preserving and keeping the nutrition. Awesome. All right, so that is all the questions that we had for now. Thanks so much, um, Shauna. And for everybody, the audience had some really excellent questions. That was really wonderful to see. So we're gonna go ahead and switch over to the hands-on kind of demonstration portion. And we have to get a couple of things ready on our end. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 10, 12. Fabulous. So what we're doing today, we're going to be making out of the So Easy to Preserve book from the National Center for Home Food Preservation is our quick sour pickles. So the recipe calls for 25 cucumbers, but since it's a demo, we're doing about half. The recipe also is letting me know that if we were to do the full recipe, we would be getting about eight pint jars. We'll use a half gallon of cider vinegar. So I have two bottles already like this to make measuring faster. I have two cups of water that have been measured out in our liquid measuring cup. Then I'm going to add our half cup of canning salt. And for salt, again, you want to use canning salt. You do not want to use sea salt. You don't want to use mineral salt. 
you don't want to use kosher salt if it was treated with an anti-caking agent. Same thing with iodized salt. You don't want to use any of those. You only want to use canning salt because it doesn't have an anti-caking property to it. And also it's not going to give you a cloudy brine. Most people, if you go to the grocery store and you're looking at your pickled products, they're going to have a nice clear brine to them. For our purposes too, we're going to need a half cup of white granulated sugar. And we'll always recommend using white granulated sugar for jams and jellies and other canning activities because it's going to give you a nice pure flavor. Whereas something, as you can imagine, like maple syrup or molasses could give you a really strong flavor that overpowers what you were trying to can in general. For us in this recipe, we're going to need a half cup of mustard seeds. Now, when you're looking at canning in terms of pickled products and fermented products, you're going to want to use, in most cases, whole fresh spices and herbs or whole um, dried herbs and spices. Another important thing I would mention is depending on how much you're canning, you may want to find a local restaurant store or something to that effect because the smaller containers of mustard seeds right now are costing $5.19. So two of those small ones give you almost a half cup and that's gonna set you back $10.40 roughly. Whereas this, I was able to buy it in bulk for a much reasonable price. So one of the things that we did ahead of time was wash our cucumbers. And another thing here when you're talking about cucumber pickles is that they recommend trimming a 16th of an inch off on the flower end. Now, I know all of you are going to know the difference between a stem and a flower end, but for a lot of the people that come to the workshops with me, don't know which end is which. So it's safe to say you can take off a 16th of an end from both and be fine. And the reason for that is that from the flower end is there's going to be enzymes that are naturally going to soften the cucumber. And if you're thinking about cucumbers, you want something with a little bit more of a bite or a crunch to it. So chopping this off prevents the enzymes near the flower end to soften up your cucumber. Another thing here, it says that uh, we're going to slice cucumbers lengthwise, pack it into hot jars, leaving a half inch of headspace. We're going to mix the vinegar, water, salt, sugar, and mustard seeds and bring it to a boil. And then we're going to fill the jars with a half inch of headspace. So typically when you're canning, you're going to put your solid pieces in the jars first and then add your hot brine. So let's see, I'm just going to shift our pot over. And since we wanted things to come to a quick boil, I brought our Bunsen, not our Bunsen burner, our butane burner. So this is locked down. I'm going to crack open the bottles so we can pour out our half gallon of 5% acidic apple cider vinegar. And I would also recommend when you are making a pickled product that you're using apple cider vinegar that's been filtered and not the unfiltered, not the unfiltered raw, just because you're not going to get as visually pleasing a end product. Now, the kind of pickle that we're doing today is considered a quick process pickle. Obviously, a fermented pickle would take a lot longer to do over the course of weeks. I'm adding my two cups of water. And then for folks that want to relive their home ec days, we're going to measure out our dry ingredients. So we'll empty out our mustard seeds, you can see that I'm using a paper plate. So anything that falls over, we can just scoop back in. I'm taking my leveled item and just skimming it off. Let's see, I can probably fit a little bit more. So I'm gonna do so. Okay, 
Yep, we got some rollers. That's okay. Okay. Then pop that in. We'll just roll these back into place. Okay. Then we need our half cup of sugar. And you'll see that some of the recipes call for a lot more sugar. There. Now the nice part is, is that you don't have to refer to this video all the time for home canning. You might want to. Um, I'm sure John and Stephanie want you to come visit the video. But if you're looking for a hands-on class, my colleagues and I do host a number of hands-on workshops. And, you know, just talk to someone and we can figure it out. Most of our classes are still $20 a person. And most of the classes aren't larger than, oh, six people or so. Because if you look at a lot of the canning recipes, you're only going to have about six to nine jars of filled food products. So there's definitely a limit based on a canner load. There. So we'll level that off with our canning salt, dump that in. We'll hold on to this for a little bit later, and then we'll just hide our mess off screen. So we'll just give this a little stir and let that come to a quick boil. So one of the important things when you are canning is that you want things to come to a quick boil. Uh, in food science world, you typically see things coming to a high temperature process for boiling for improved quality. Long, slow boiling is not what you want. So here we have our knife. Doesn't matter how big or small, whatever is comfortable for you. If you do have a knife that is stainless steel, having it sharpened and sharp is much better than a dull knife. Um, in terms of knife safety, again, for basics, pinch, hold, and I've seen a lot of people do this method, but you don't have much control over the blade when you put your finger out here. If some of you watch cooking shows, you'll see even the professionals do this, but this kind of hold is gonna give you a lot more control over the blade. So one of the things that we did prior to the start was we rinsed over our break. So this is a pickling cucumber. Um, I was told that pickling cucumbers are going to be a sweeter taste. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, again, keeping my fingers curled in. I'm just going to chop off a little piece. I'll chop off the other end, making sure I have a nice firm hold. And then since it's lengthwise, I'm just going to probably find the flattest part of the cucumber so it doesn't roll. And then again, keeping my fingers away from the blade, just go straight down. That looks pretty good. Okay. I also have my funnel ready for when that's needed. And then since I have a lot of different screw bands, I'm just gonna take those out, hopefully a little bit on the quieter side and put the finished cucumbers that we chopped into that. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the freshest cucumbers for today. As we know, we're kind of getting out of the summer season of cucumbers and into the fall. So we're a little bit in between, but we're gonna make do with what we have. So I'm gonna select the best ones. So for me, the best ones are gonna be ones that are not soft. There. Another thing too, if you are using cucumbers to pickle, is that you want to use cucumbers that aren't store-bought in the sense that the cucumbers have that wax coat on them. The wax coat isn't going to be good for brine penetration. So these ones are not wax covered, which is nice. Other things too, as you can imagine, uh, uniformity in size is helpful. I'm sure we're going to struggle a bit at some point for the height of the cucumbers to the jar height. So we'll probably need to do some additional trimming. And if that's the case, that's fine. Now, again, we're trying to keep to what the recipe said in terms of 
keeping things lengthwise. This was pretty soft, so I'm just gonna top off all of that end. And the nice part is I'm guessing many of you also have a compost pile. So what isn't this year's cucumber pickles can be next year's in one form or another. There. So the nice part about cucumber pickles is that they're, depending on the recipe, really easy to slice. Now, some of you might want the ones that are chips. And if that's the case, again, having the bubble wand, you can almost use every quarter inch as a little guide or ruler if you don't have one available. Okay. Other things too to know is sometimes the recipes from the National Center for Home Food Preservation do give you tips for how long you want your cucumber or other types of pickle products to hang out and let the flavors meld. These, they don't give a recommendation, but if you're making the pickled carrots, which are also really good, they say, I think three to four days or three to four weeks. I, I forget which one. Okay, so let me try to get my space a little bit more organized. I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, I think what I will do is, hmm, we might move a couple of jars or I'll, maybe I'll just bring over what I think I'll need so I can show you. And then we can, as a group later, go over and I can show you what's happening at the canner. So we're coming to a good boil. Um, so let me take that off, we'll stop that. And again, I don't want hot jar on cold stainless steel. So I am going to use some towels to dampen um, or mediate the heat part. So let me just clean this. Pretty sure my former chef bosses would not appreciate a dirty area. So we'll do that. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to lay this out and then I'll bring over a couple of jars. So we do have our jar lifter. You can see that it's curved, the handles are here. And just to give you an idea, this is what you want, right? Nice and safe. I've seen people do this, not safe, it makes me nervous. So structure is the function and we see that here. Another thing too, is that we can also use the jar lifters in another way. So let me get some jars. Let me get my pot holders just in case. And so you may think, you know, I'm going to do some canning. That's great. But depending on the recipes, they may be more labor intensive. So I remember I was having a canning workshop for peaches. I think I bought 11 pounds of peaches and the people that paid to show up to class never showed up. So I had a lot of peaches to process. Luckily I had enough, I feel like kitchen jobs where I got through blanching and peeling those peaches real fast. But if you're someone that, you know, takes a little bit more time for some of the kitchen pieces, again, if we're thinking back to the old, older days, canning was a community kind of thing. So having family help or friends, right? Maybe some of you don't have the ideal stove top, but you know someone who does. Maybe it's something that the two of you can work on together, especially if you're someone that has all the produce growing in their home. So you can see that we have various mason jars that are all regular mouth. So what I mean by various jars is that this one's an, let's call it an older style, right? We have the glass embossment on the outside. This one is more of the style that you're seeing now, it's smooth you don't have the marks up here. And I like these smoother jars that are more current just because they're easy to maneuver inside your jars. So to give you a rundown, we want a half inch of headspace. So each little stair step doodad is gonna be a quarter inch. So I'm gonna find the half inch. If I rest it here, I want my cucumbers just to be touching here and then we'll add our liquid to just be touching there as well. 
So obviously our cucumbers are a little too big and that's fine, it is what it is. So we'll just trim them down a little bit. So let's see, let's do what we'll call a possible model one. There. So again, I rather have them a little shorter than too tall just for the ease of things. And you will see that there are going to be certain recipes that do state like, oh, cut them into spears. But since this one didn't say spears or slices, we're just going to keep it as the recipe recommended. So again, what we're doing today is considered a raw pack method where we're putting raw uncooked produce into our jars. And then we're gonna add the hot brining solution. So one of the things here is that when you are canning and using a raw pack method is you're able to shove in the produce pretty well, like you see here, right? Um, and that's because again, these weren't allowed to boil ahead of time. So we're just going to assume that they're going to start shrinking during the processing time and they will do that. Okay, so let me trim up a few more. And then I know the office is really looking forward to cucumbers with their lunch. So we're gonna make sure we fill what we have here. Again, um, the nice part with cucumbers is they're a little easier to slice to scale. Another thing too with canning is that you can see that for a lot of the things that you'll see at the state fair, of course, there's varying ability. Everyone's practicing and that's a good thing, right? The name of the game is to have produce for the season that you can enjoy all year long. And so when people come to my canning classes, I typically tell them I am not teaching them how to do blue ribbon canning. That's where the art and practice at home comes in. So you can probably say, eh, I could probably do a much better job packing them in, make them look a lot prettier. Yes, I completely agree with you. But again, this is, this is great for demo purposes. Okay, yeah. So the question is, would we extend the um, storage time of squashes and things like that if you trim the blossom end off? So I think it's gonna be dependent on how you're planning on storing your, your produce, right? So for us in food safety world, once you slice into a whole piece of produce, you're kind of starting a timer on for when it's going to spoil. So I would say that for your squash, whether it's summer or winter squash, it's probably not a good idea to trim them. Again, you know, if you're pickling them, right? You're making a pickled zucchini or something like that, then yes, maybe you do trim off a little bit because you want a certain crunch or texture. But if I was gonna say eating your squash or, um, something else with a flowered end on a regular basis, you probably don't need to. Canning purposes, sure, why not? Um, in addition to the cucumbers, can you use store-bought cucumbers? Sure. Peeled store-bought, I don't think I've noticed them. Um, Oh yeah, so I bought store-bought today because again, I wasn't able to pick up the cucumbers like I thought I was going to be able to today from our local urban farm. Um, so I was able to buy some store-bought cucumbers that were for pickling specifically. So these are not wax covered at all. I should have actually gotten one that was wax colored so you could see the difference. So now I'm gonna start filling with brine. So what other questions do we have? Um, can you talk more about whether you should peel your ribs often as the can cools? Is it okay if they pop? And if they don't pop, are they still okay? 
So the question is about lid popping. Is it a good thing when they're cooling? Is it concerning if you don't hear them pop while they're cooling? So I'll say that when you hear a lid pop while they're being taken out and start cooling, that's a good sign that it's on the right track. But if you don't hear it pop, not a big deal because again, they need to sit for 12 to 24 hours undisturbed. So you might have that popping um, sometime thereafter. Now, one of the things here is you saw me put all the solid cucumbers in and now I'm starting to add the brine. So again, I'm filling the brine up to, to the um, half inch of headspace. So you want it to just touch the bottom. I'm also gonna try to get out any possible air bubbles and you know it's a little tight, but it is what it is. But I like to have folks go all the way down and all the way around. So let's see if that changes our headspace just a little bit. So we'll add a little bit more brine. Okay, that looks good. So now I'm going to get my damp paper towel. And then you only just need to get the top of the rim because again, that's where it's going to happen in terms of the vacuum seal. I'm using the lid magnet because it's fun. And then fingertip tight. So feeling a little resistance, that's it. We're gonna call that a day for that can. So obviously you'd write the name, the date, what the food product was. And that's that would be a can of cucumber pickles ready to, to go back into the water bath canner. So another thing too, uh, last two weeks ago when I was working with some 4-H youth, we did the same recipe. And this can be hot, right? We brought things up to a boil. So one of the things you can do if you're not comfortable holding hot jars is you can use your jar lifter sometimes to help stabilize and work, especially if you're trying to screw the jar lid back on. Some people, I know there's a lot of other gadgets that you can also use to do the same purpose, but that might be a nice, easy solution for you to work with. So one of the things to share that looks pretty good is that when you are canning, you're going to see when we take our jars out at the end that there's probably going to be some float. So the float is going to be a space between the produce and the bottom of the jar. Right now, everything is sitting pretty tight to the base, but once things start processing, we'll see more of the cucumbers lift up. So I'm just gonna quickly turn our canner up to a little bit higher temperature so we're not waiting as long for things to come to a boil. That's another thing I'm not a huge fan about in terms of electric stoves, it takes things a little bit longer to heat up. We had someone say that they were taught to turn their fries over when canning to help steam. So for home canning, we just don't recommend it. You will see if you're doing a more of a commercial processing of canned items that you might actually invert it. So what I'm talking about is, let's say this is our canned products. We took them out of the water bath canner or pressure canner and letting them sit like this. So you will see this being recommended again, more for commercial canned items. But for home canning, we just say, leave them upright like this. Yeah, I'd actually be curious if there's going to be um, more blending between the two. So. I know with the National Center for Home Food Preservation, they recently hired a new director because Dr. Elizabeth Andrus, one of the authors of So Easy to Preserve, retired in oh, 2019. So Dr. Carla Schwann is the new director for home food preservation. And so currently um, she's working on building up her lab. And I know some of the goals of their group is to update some of the recipes. So in terms of updating uh, jams and jellies with less sugar, new recipes that might require roasting something like a tomato before you're using it for um, a tomato sauce or a marinara. 
So that's something to look forward to actually in the future. So another important thing too, especially if you're doing something like jams or jellies, we would recommend that you would boil your fruit, your pectin, your commercial lemon juice, your white granulated sugar in a single batch, right? A lot of times when we're making cookies or something, you might double the recipe because it's easy to do. But something like jams and jellies, you want to use a single recipe because for quality reasons, you really want a single batch made, jarred, processed, and then have that clean break where you start setting up for that second canner load and that second batch of jam and jelly being mixed. If you are someone that's looking for a lower sugar option with jams and jellies, you can look for ones that use um, a sugar sweetener that's, I think for these recipes, it might be Splenda that they've tested. Um, I know people are very curious in using other types of sugars, but again, we would recommend using for a shelf stable jam or jelly to use one of the National Center or USDA recipes. If you have the freezer space or the refrigerator space, to create a jam or jelly with less sugar, but is not shelf stable, then put it in your fridge or freezer based on your sugar preferences. Let me take out a little bit more there. So I think at this point, we are going to be ready to put the jars back into our canner. So if you want to adjust with the camera, we can start getting that ready. So I'm gonna fill up one more jar and then I can just do probably a better job explaining the funnel piece. So here, obviously I have the funnel sitting here. Um, one of the things to note is that the glass threads can kind of give you a visual about the headspace. So the bottom is about an inch, halfway is obviously about half an inch for what we're aiming for. And some of these top Threads up here is more of a quarter if you're doing jams or jellies. Another thing when you are funneling the liquids in, you want to pour it down the sides. And you'll see that if you are someone that has canned previously and you have your solids doing like the iceberg look above the liquid level, you might see some discoloring because again, with canning, you do ideally want to have the solids and the liquids at a nice level height. Okay, that actually looks pretty good. Okay, all right. So we have this, we have our screw band. So I'm putting it around a little resistance. That's it, I'm not hunkering it in. So we have five jars that are ready to go. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is just put our jars in. Okay. And then we'll take our, there we go. Okay. So if you wanna do a brief over the top, you can see that this jar here is going to be a wide mouth where it's a much wider. And this, these other ones are regular mouths. The regular mouths have the shoulder, the wide mouths have straight edges. And you can also see that these jars don't have any food in them and that's fine. We want to use those as placeholders. So the five jars that are filled with food don't tip over and process on the side. Another key thing is that you want about an inch or more of water above the top of your jar. So you can say they're being fully processed in a water bath canner. So if I treat this like a dipstick, we see that we're at an inch level, so that's good. You also may see some air bubbles starting to escape out of the jars and that's natural. There's still things going on. So we're gonna put the lid on. We have our burner up to high and we're going to wait for a rolling boil. Now, one thing to note is that the canner that I'm using is best for a gas stove. 
not a smooth top, but since this is what we have for today, we're rolling with it. I can promise you that for home canning on a smooth top or an electric coil, the best thing to do would actually be using a smooth bottom canner. You can essentially make a canner, a water bath canner out of anything. You really just need that rack between the base of the canner and the jars so the jars aren't sitting flush like this on the base. So I've had people say that they've used old screw bands like this and kind of MacGyver their own base so a glass jar is off the ground. So I mean, some of it comes into play of how much volume and jars worth of food do you really want, right? Some of them might be a bit smaller in size, but that's okay. Other things to know is depending on your canner, you can actually double stack jars. So obviously for the canner height we have, we probably wouldn't double stack pint jars, but we may choose to double stack half pint jars if we were doing jams or jellies. And there's some um, extra pieces you'd want to have to make sure that when you are double stacking jars that they're good to go. So how are we doing on questions? All right, so I know we only talked about pickles. I kind of mentioned some jams and jellies, but I'm happy to try to answer other food products that can be canned or frozen or dried. Okay, so that's a good question. So siphoning is going to be something that happens when you take, and I'll use this as an example. Let's pretend this pot was our water bath canner, our jar is processed, and I take hot jar out and put it out to cool. You might see siphoning. So siphoning is typically when you see water, your brine level like reduced or whatever the liquid level reduced in your jar. And so what we'll see, what we do is that after our jars process for 10 minutes, we're going to turn off the burner, remove the lid of our canner, and then let our jars of pickles sit in the jars for another five minutes before we take them out. And that extra five minutes for a boiling water bath canner or an extra 10 minutes in a pressure canner is going to help prevent siphoning. So it's just too much temperature fluctuations going on between the jar and its environment. So in terms of how much liquid loss during siphoning is okay, is typically we don't want to see your jars with, we don't wanna see your jars that have lost liquid for over half of the jar size. So here we have a quart size and if we lost liquid due to siphoning and the water level was up to here, this would be okay. The vacuum might seal might not be as strong. You might get some discoloration based on whatever was in your food, but that would be considered safe. Now, if I lost liquid due to siphoning and my jar and the liquid level is down here, I would say put it in my refrigerator or freeze it because that's gonna cause some potential food safety issues. And if you're still uncomfortable with that much water loss, whether it's in the safe range, you could always put it in your refrigerator or freezer for a later time and date. Shona, if I'm using an electric burner, should I heat up the stove first? It takes a while to fully heat up. So the question was, if I have an electric burner, should I heat it up prior to? So one of the things that we did was we actually Cleaned the glass jars, filled the canner that you saw. And while I was giving you all the background PowerPoint, which was about an hour, we were letting that come to a boil. So yeah, I would say definitely get your water boiling, whether it's on a gas or an electric stove top, because depending on your recipe, and again, it's gonna be based on your comfort preparing food, as well as how involved your recipe might be you might want to pre-start that sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, an earlier question I didn't hear the answer to. Can you tell us what kind of a portable burner you're using? 
Oh, so, uh, so the kind of portable burner that I am using, I just went to the restaurant store or depot or outlet. Um, and then I just got one that was a butane burner. So it looks like this, nothing fancy, not expensive. Uh, some of you that might do more camping because that's not something I enjoy, might already have these kind of stoves. And I'm just using this because it was easier to show for the demonstration. A thing to note when you are thinking about using an electric coil, a smooth top or gas is that you want to make sure that the flame or the heat base is appropriate for your canner base. So what does that mean? Basically, we don't want your canner base to overlap by four inches or more, because then the heat hitting your base of your canner is going to be a little inaccurate and not efficient. So we want the biggest burner being used for your canning activities. So again, um, if we had a wider base and it was overlapping four or more inches from the surface area of the heat source, not a good choice for canning. Again, again, for something like the butane, just thinking about constant heat, right? The butane burners are going to give out at some point. So like this one was getting a little low. So I switched out a nice full one because I didn't want it to stop and switch out in the middle of things. What's the official recommendation on water glassing farm fresh unwashed eggs? So the question is, what is the recommendation for water glassing farm fresh eggs? I'm not familiar with the term water glassing, um, but I do know that for eggs, if you have backyard chickens compared to buying eggs at a grocery store, you wanna keep things that are cold, still cold. So if you're buying your eggs from a grocery store or a farmer's market and they had it in a cooler chest, you wanna keep those eggs cold and refrigerated just like they did. Now, if you have your own backyard eggs, you can keep them out at room temperature, but you can also keep them in the refrigerator. And so the idea is, is that something like a backyard chicken laying eggs versus the commercial, the commercial, maybe lack of a better word, but the commercial or even the uh, farmer's market eggs, they're probably definitely for commercial, probably for farmer's market, those eggs are being washed. So the cuticle that's naturally on the eggshell might lose its quality. So I'm gonna check on our water because we still need to see that it's coming to a boil. So our canner is at a rolling boil. So I'm gonna start our timer for 10 minutes. So that would put us, let's see, like 11.04, okay. What, what other food, food safety, safety questions, questions do you have? have? That, that was, that's, that's my specialty, specialty. Consumer, consumer food safety. safety. Sure. Yes. We've got more, Shauna. If I'm doing a big batch of pressure. All right. If I'm doing a big batch of pressure canned chicken stock, can I do the cooking on one day, chill and skim the fat, and can it, and can it the next day, understanding that I'd be boiling the, the stock prior to canning? Yeah, that would be safe because again, uh, chicken stock, it's very liquidy, right? You're not gonna have any solid pieces in it. And because I'm assuming it's going to be a hot pack method where you would need to have your chicken stock warm, that shouldn't be a food safety risk. Okay, half batches like you're doing here are safe, right? I don't have quite enough tomatoes for a whole sauce recipe. Yeah, so the question is doing a half batch of canning like we did today, because you might not have enough cucumbers or tomatoes. So that's safe to do. Again, you might not have a canner load like we did. We filled five of the nine jars up with food product and the other four are left blank because we want our jars to process up and down. So those blanks are making sure the ones filled with food stay upright. So if I'm doing something like pickling, the limiting factor in most cases is probably going to be the brine, right? 
So you could can all day long, but I might need to make another batch of brine. And I would do that up as the recipe calls for. But if you're doing tomatoes, right, depending on the recipe, tomatoes might say have or whole tomatoes packed in water, packed in their own juices. So you might not even have to worry about having additional liquids based on the recipe, especially for something like tomatoes. And kind of a related question, if we only have enough tomato sauce or jam or jelly to fill a jar half full, is it still okay to process it? Maybe. I yeah, so if you're able to fill a jar that's only half full or a quarter full, can you still put it in a boiling water bath canner for processing? I would say no, because again, if you're thinking about the headspace, if you're filling a jar that's half full, your headspace is going to be much larger than what's recommended. So the jar isn't going to seal as well. So if it's only a half jar that's left, I would say put it in the refrigerator or freezer. I mean, even for today, we could have put this one cucumber in one jar, but is it worth it? No. Is it probably better off as a snack later? Yes. So we'll do that. We'll put that in the fridge and snack on it later. Sounds good. How likely is it that farm stands or small markets use the thorough technique you are using? I know I did not when I home canned peaches 40 years ago. They were fantastic Red Haven peaches, but I did not use a pressure cooker and I eyeballed the space at the top. So the question is, um, how do we know that any canned product jams tomatoes at a farmer's market is doing something like this that we're doing here to the to the rule, right? So that's gonna vary. I mean, as someone that's buying a potential jar of canned salsa or jam or jelly at the farmer's market, you could ask the vendor, oh, what's your process for canning, right? That's the beauty of the farmer's market. You get to have these interactions. Now you have that piece. Then you have another aspect of it of food safety regulations. So right now, Maryland has the cottage food act or business. And what the cottage food business allows people to do is to make non potentially hazardous food items out of their own home kitchen and sell it at public events like farmers markets. So some plain Jane like me could make strawberry jam and sell it at the farmers market. But if you're a farmer, you're probably going to be looking at a different set of regulations than cottage food. So if I'm a farmer, I'm most likely going to do the on-farm home processing license. It's an annual license issued by the Maryland Department of Health. And that's going to give me a little bit more breadth of creating food items out of my farm kitchen or home kitchen. So something that a farmer can make and can and sell at a farmer's market that a normal person can't would be an acidified food item like tomato sauce. So what a farmer would have to do if they were trying to sell tomato sauce at the farmer's market or their own farm stand is that one, they would have to go through a better process control school to say that they have the knowledge and food science understanding of canning then they would have to work with a process authority to show that their recipe for their farm marinara is safe meeting pH and time and temperature recommendations. And then they would also have to work with the state health department's office of food protection to make sure all the paperwork, the labeling and anything else is lined up to being able to sell that product. So there are different rules for what people might want to sell at the farmer's market. The third tier of regulations would be a processing license. And that would be taking what we're doing to a much larger commercial scale. A thing of interest for some of you is that different states are going to have different food items that can be made out of a home kitchen under the cottage food business plan or act. So Maryland, it's mainly most breads, most jams and jellies, most food products. If we were in um, 
Pennsylvania, you would have to get licensed and audited by the health department in Pennsylvania, where they would come and inspect your kitchen before you made anything for sale. Uh, Arkansas and Tennessee, for example, they recently passed the Food Freedom Act, and they're letting anything, anything out of your home kitchen being able to sell. So uh, I was talking to some food safety specialist friends of mine recently, and they said that they, they had, had to, to have some eager food businesses take back food because there was botulism risks for the meat products and the method used. So, I mean, yeah, if you're ever looking for a good episode, PBS, they have, oh gosh, Poison Squad or something like that. But basically, it kind of gives you the history of the USDA. Uh, they do mention FDA as well, but basically how regulations came about. Because wouldn't you love John, Stephanie, and I sweeping up whatever is on the floor, putting it in a bottle, and selling it at the mass, next Master Gardener meeting as like secret spice mix, right? And that's what people were able to do back then. Because some of you might be familiar with Connecticut's motto as the nutmeg state. And so the history of that is that peddlers back in colonial days would be scraping bark off of trees and selling it as like the exotic nutmeg. So um, regulations are there for a purpose. Interesting, interesting. Um, if you decide to freeze a jar that has lost its liquid, do you, do you break the seal before putting it in the freezer? So if you were freezing a can of tomatoes that wasn't at the right headspace, would you break the seal and put the jar into the freezer? I would say it's going to be up to you because maybe you want to empty the content of the jar into a freezable plastic bag because of how things are organized in your freezer. Some of you might want that glass jar and the metal screw band back to do more canning. Others of you might say, yeah, this looks good. I'm going to pop it in the freezer and that's fine too. Um, I want to say that the headspace recommendations for canning is also going to be appropriate for freezing because again, as things freeze up, they expand and that headspace is there for especially more rigid containers. So you, your container doesn't crack or break. Great, last question, Shauna. Uh, clarification, how can we sign up for the hands-on class that was mentioned earlier for $20? Is that also on the UME website? So how do you sign up for hands-on workshops? Can you go to the extension website? Uh, so. I'm also working on our food safety website and that's been a little slow, but we're catching steam. I would say the best option if you are interested on hands-on workshops is one, see what's going on in your county office. Uh, maybe they have an upcoming class, maybe they don't. If you do know who the FCS agent is for your county or your cluster, you can get in contact with them and work things out. I know for Baltimore County, it's sometimes a logistics between when I'm available, when you're available, when the kitchen space is available. And those are things that might need to work out. All right, and Stephanie's putting the link to the website in. All right, so we're getting close to taking the time, the lid off and the um, killing the heat. So this is not horribly exciting. So, all right, we our jars have processed for 10 minutes. Turn off the heat source, remove the lid, and now we wait five minutes. Nothing, nothing too crazy. But if you want to take a peek, we see nothing's floating. We see everything looks as it should. And you can also get an idea of how rigorous a boil we were working with. If your glass did break during the processing, you would often see one jar floating. We don't see that, so that's a good sign. So what we're gonna do for the five minutes is I'm gonna hop on the computer and then share a couple of the websites we talked about. And I think that will 
probably be a better use of our time. Resources. Yeah, right. I feel like half the battle is knowing what are the best resources to use for a lot of these things. Okay. So, okay. So let me open up. Yeah, let's, let's do the launch meeting one. I'll share that website and let me queue up a few things here. Okay. So if we go to the national, we'll type in the National Center for Home Food Preservation. We click here. And they've updated their website, which is nice. So again, their intro. That's great, but again, canning, freezing, drying, curing, fermenting, that's all in their wheelhouse. Now let's say you don't wanna do pickles. Let's go to peaches because it's peach season. We'll go into peaches. We'll do peach halves or slices and it's nice. The recipe will kind of give you these tips and tricks. So we see here, they actually say that if you're canning peaches, you want to use yellow peaches because the pH is more appropriate for a water bath canning where white peaches might run a higher pH number. So you may want to acidify or pressure can them. They also mention roughly the poundage you'll need, whether you're canning quarts or pints. They give you tips on quality as well as the procedure. And then for our peaches, you could either hot pack or raw pack them. The other part that's nice is that they give you some recommendations for processing times based on your method of canning. So here we have table one for peaches that are going to be canned using a boiling water bath canner. Again, you see the style of pack, hot or raw, raw being what we did today, raw produce, hot liquid, hot pack would be cooking the liquid and produce before putting it in jars. Table two, we see the process time for peaches in a dial gauge pressure canner. So you can make the correct adjustments for pressure. And then number three, we see the recommendation for peaches in a weighted gauge pressure canner. Another website here for search is the USDA items. So we can actually visit this. And typically for the hands-on workshops, you would receive guide number one, which is a lot of the basic principles that we talked about today in the PowerPoint lecture. But then you can also see that they have additional guides that are more catered to certain groups of food items. So you can learn a little bit more tips and tricks to that. If you're someone that is going to be canning next year, but you don't want to read all this stuff for how to can again. If you type in videos, they also have some nice videos on different topics. So I just want to highlight here, boiling water bath canning. So you could watch in a very short video how to use a boiling water bath canner in all the major steps that you would want in a concise form. The other website I wanted to share was Maryland's, marylandsbest.net, which will take you here. We'll click visit the farm. So again, if your garden isn't producing enough produce, you still have this tool. So you can look up by organic, non-organic, CSA, based on your location, whether it's within the county or a city in a county or town. And then you can always type in peaches if you were looking for peaches and you would get a user-friendly map pretty quickly. So in terms of process authorities, let's see, we'll go to AFTO's website. There are neighbors to the north up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And so this is the Association of Food and Drug Officials. Really great group. So one of the things that we're gonna look for is a process authority.
and they actually have a directory. So we'll click here. And you can look by location. So you could search by state. You could search by the type of food. So here we have huh, Kimberly Baker at Clemson. Let me type in Maryland to see what comes up here. I don't think oh, Maryland update. So here we have an example of a private consulting lab in Baltimore. I'll go to Virginia because Virginia Tech actually has a process authority. Penn State, I'm pretty sure does not. Rutgers does have a process authority as well as Cornell University for some of the more um, local ones to us. There we go. So this is Virginia Tech's uh, Joelle Eifert is in charge of that. So we'll just quickly buzz over to Virginia Tech's uh, Food Innovation Center for program. So if we go here and we worked with them before. So let's see as the website is slowly booting up. There we go. Typically, you're going to be asked the weight of your ingredients, the process method, as well as sending a sample of a jar down to them for the testing. So what we're gonna do now, um, just since you were able to see this piece, we're going to go back over to the canner and I'll remove the jars so you can see what that looks like. So let me stop sharing the screen here and then We'll take a gander and get the jars out. So one of the things to remember is that the jars, um, they're going to have water on the lids and that's okay. We'll move this again so we don't have extreme temperature fluctuations, even though I doubt the counter is really cold, but it's a good practice in muscle memory. I'm going to go in and get the jar that's easiest. I'm going to take it straight up over and down. I'm not trying to shake it. I'm not trying to drain off the water. It's going to evaporate. Okay. We're gonna give our jars as much space as we can so they can slowly cool. There is a technique that you can use called low uh, low temperature pasteurization. And the theory behind that is that it can help keep a better crunch on your cucumbers, but you would need a candy thermometer and you would need to keep the temperature constant at 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes of processing. And they recommend that you could use this low temperature pasteurization method for literally any pickled fermented product except their reduced sodium pickles, because then there's some safety concerns. Other things to note too, is that when you are canning for pickles, you want to use something like stainless steel for bringing your brine solution to a boil. Uh, what we might've used might not have been great because you don't want anything to interact with the vinegar prematurely. So I did hear a pop, which means it's on the right track. Again, ideally we would have a place in your kitchen where you can let your jar sit undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. Um, so we saw, we heard a slight pop. Hopefully we'll hear more. Another thing to note too, you're still seeing air bubbles come up and that's natural. We don't see too much fruit. Actually this one, we see a little bit more fruit float but not too bad. We might see it higher up the next day. But again, um, that's pretty typical for raw packed food products and something that maybe over practice you're able to reduce. But um, we'll also share a link maybe later on for Stephanie. So if you are interested in starting a cottage food business, we are offering folks for a free time, a self-paced course to kind of learn more about the regulations, the 
marketing tactics and things of that nature. And I think that's that's really it. All right, folks, so that does wrap up our presentation for today. We're so appreciative of Shauna's time and lending all her expertise to us. I know I learned a lot, so I hope y'all did too. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up with some of the information that Shauna shared, because I know everybody wants to have those resources. And also just a reminder, in case you didn't hear at the beginning, this webinar is recorded and it's posted on a playlist on HGIC's YouTube channel. And it's also posted on the Master Gardener Continuing Education webpage. If you look there and scroll down underneath where our current events are, there's a list of previously recorded webinars that are always available for everyone there. So thanks again for joining us today and for being here and learning with us. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you all again soon. Take care.